Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the adaptive immune response and uh, immunosuppressant drugs. Okay, so we are currently in the process of looking at the PI3 kinase AKT uh, mTOR pathway because this is uh, the pathway, uh, well, one of the pathways by which signal 3 operates and causes the differentiation and then the proliferation uh, of the T cell. Okay, so if it's a CD8 positive naive T cell, it would differentiate into a cytotoxic T cell and then proliferate uh, if upon receiving signal 3, and if it's a CD4 positive naive T cell, then it will uh, differentiate into a T helper naught cell and then proliferate into a whole population of T helper naught cells, okay, upon receiving signal 3. And it's this pathway, this PI3 kinase M AKT uh, mTOR pathway uh, that rapamycin is going to act on, so we're just going through this pathway. Okay, so we've discussed that uh, when uh, interleukin-2 binds to the complete interleukin-2 receptor, then what happens is these two enzymes, Janus kinase 1, JAK1, and Janus kinase 3, JAK3, become activated, and they phosphorylate tyrosine residues on the cytoplasmic domain of the interleukin-2 receptor beta component. Okay, now these phosphotyrosine residues on the cytoplasmic domain of the interleukin-2 uh, receptor beta component will uh, recruit this PI3 kinase enzyme from the cytoplasm, and it will bind to the phosphotyrosine residues via an SH2 domain, which stands for SARC homology 2 domain, okay? Uh, which is on its surface. Okay, so you now have recruited this PI3 kinase to the membrane, and this doesn't activate the enzyme because the enzyme was already activated, but it now brings the enzyme to its target, and its target is phosphatidylinositol 4 5 bisphosphate molecules that are in uh, the cell membrane of uh, the uh, naive CD4 positive or CD8 positive T cell. Okay, and what it's going to do is it's going to add a phosphate group onto this phosphatidylinositol 4,5 bisphosphate molecule, and it's going to add it onto the third carbon of this inositol ring. So remember, we named the carbons of the inositol ring 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um, and that's it. So we're going to stick an extra phosphate group onto this third carbon. That's what PI3 kinase is going to do to phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. It's going to put an additional phosphate group onto the third uh, alcohol group, or the third carbon of the inositol ring. Okay, now what do you get now? Well, you get what is known as PIP3, okay? And uh, this stands for phosphatidylinositol, which makes sense because we've still got a phosphatidylinositol molecule that's the basis of it all, and that is abbreviated to PI for short. The phosphatidyl is the P, the I is the inositol, okay? And then it's 3, 4, 5, tris phosphate, okay? And that's abbreviated to P for phosphate, and then you put that subscript 3 to denote that you've got three phosphate groups, so trisphosphate, phosphatidylinositol 345-trisphosphate, or PIP3 for short, is this molecule that you now produce. Now, usually you will not have any phosphatidylinositol 345-trisphosphate in the membrane of uh, your cell. The reason being that there is an enzyme, okay, and where should I put this enzyme? There is an enzyme within the membrane of the cell, which is known as P10, which basically is a phosphatase. It removes phosphate groups, and it is going to remove the phosphate group off this third carbon of the inositol ring, and therefore it will return PIP3 into PIP2. So, PI3 kinase turns PIP2 into PIP3, and P10 turns PIP3 back into PIP2. So usually you don't have any PIP3 in your membrane because PI3 kinase isn't usually active, uh, but P10 is. So it will destroy any PIP3 that is there and convert it all back into PIP2. However, when we activate the PI3 kinase, for a moment, you will get a transient rise in PI3 kinase, sorry, PIP3 in the membrane. So for a moment, there's going to be PIP3 in the membrane. 
So, what is this PIP3 going to do? Okay, so it's going to recruit certain enzymes to the uh, phospholipid bile there. So let me show this. So if we have our phospholipid bile there here, it's going to actually recruit two enzymes, and it's going to activate one of them. So if we draw a, a PIP3 molecule here, so here's the phosphate group that comes off the glycerol molecule. Here is our inositol ring, and then we've got these three phosphate groups that come off the inositol ring. And I'm going to colour this in because it looks slightly formidable without the colours. Okay, so here are these long chain carboxylic acids in orange. Here is our glycerol molecule in green. Here is the phosphate group that comes off the glycerol molecule in purple here. And here is the inositol ring coming off that phosphate group that makes us phosphatidyl inositol. Then coming off the inositol ring, you have three phosphate groups. This is the third one, the fourth one, and the fifth one. So here is our molecule of PIP3. Now, one of the enzymes that is going to get recruited to the phospholipid bile there by binding to PIP3 is an enzyme known as phosphoinositide-dependent kinase 1. Okay, so let me put this here. So, this whole enzyme here, which I'm going to highlight in turquoise, this is phosphoinositide-dependent kinase 1. And it's going to be recruited to the phospholipid bile there. So usually it's within the cytoplasm, but when the PIP3 becomes available in the cell membrane, it's going to bind to that and therefore will stay at the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bile there. And then also, not only does it just get recruited to the um, inner leaflet of the phospholipid bile there, it's also actually activated by this PIP3. So this is phospho inositide dependent kinase 1 and because phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1 is a bit of a mouthful it's often just abbreviated to uh, PDK1 okay so phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1 or PDK1 now it's a kinase enzyme so it adds phosphate groups onto, um, specifically, it's a serine threonine kinase, so it's going to add phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues within proteins. And it has now been activated, so not only does it move to the phospholipid bile there by binding to the PIP3, but also it was inactive before, and now once it's bound to PIP3, it's active. Okay, now, PIP3 is also going to recruit another enzyme to the phospholipid bile there, but this time it's not going to activate this one. Okay, so here is another molecule of PIP3 here. So the three phosphate groups coming off our inositol ring here. Okay, and I'll just extend the phospholipid bile there up to it. Okay, so let's colour it in again. So here are the long chain carboxylic acids. Here in green is our glycerol molecule, and let me just straighten up this piece of paper. There we go. Uh, and here in pink is our four phosphate groups. Okay, and then finally the inositol ring in blue here. Okay, so another enzyme is going to come and bind to PIP3 molecules that are in the uh, phospholipid bile there, and therefore is going to be recruited to the um, underside of the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bile there. Okay, and this enzyme is a very famous enzyme. This is the AKT enzyme, and that's its old name. It's so important that it's now got another name. It's also known as protein kinase B. Okay, so all of the protein kinase enzymes are extremely important, so this must be extremely important. Okay, so this is AKT, which is a name that you will often see if you do read the primary or secondary research literature. They love AKT, uh, but students prefer protein kinase B, okay, or PKB for short, but it's the same enzyme we're talking about. Okay, and this is PKB. And the nice um, reviews and primary research papers uh, usually put AKT, and then they put forward slash protein kinase B. So they put
put both names basically. Okay, now uh, AKT again is usually within the cytoplasm, but when the PIP3 is available in the membrane, it will bind to the PIP3 and therefore remain attached to the underside of the phospholipid bilayer. However, it does not become activated by uh, binding to PIP3. It is again a serine free anine kinase, but it, at the moment is still inactive. So what's it going to be activated by? Well, it's going to be activated by phosphorylation by the phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1. So PDK1 is going to stick a phosphate group onto um, the AKT protein kinase B enzyme, and then that addition of this phosphate group onto the protein kinase B or AKT enzyme is what's going to uh, activate the protein kinase B or AKT enzyme and now it's going to go on to have downstream effect. So overall we can summarize this pathway so far to um, the activation of the interleukin-2 receptor has led to the activation of this AKT enzyme or protein kinase B and that really is now what's going to cause uh, the downstream effects. Okay, so AKT is going to activate something known as mTORC1. Okay, so let me explain what this is because this is what the target for our drug rapamycin is. So, this stands for the mammalian target of rapamycin, or some people will call it uh, the mechanistic target of rapamycin, and it's the mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1. Okay, so just take the initials and you get mTORC1. So M is for mammalian, T is for target, O is for of, R is for rapamycin, C is for complex, and then 1. Okay, so this is a whole bunch of proteins that are all bound together, okay? So the starting one, the main one, the one after which the whole complex is named, is a protein known as mTOR, okay? And it's customary to um, write mTOR with a lowercase m and then all the rest in capitals. Okay, so mTOR stands for the mammalian target of rapamycin. Okay, or again, um, there's a movement to have it renamed the mechanistic target of rapamycin rather than the mammalian target of rapamycin. Okay, I don't really know why that is. Potentially, rapamycin also works like this in non-mammalian cells. I don't know. That's probably the reason. Okay. Uh, mammalian target of rapamycin. So, this is a protein, okay, and it's going to be complexed with a whole bunch of other proteins to make the mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1, or mTORC1. So, we'll start with this protein, and then let's put some other proteins onto this complex. So, the next protein we're going to add on, um, and we're going to stick it onto mTOR, is a protein known as Raptor, okay? So R-A-P-T-O-R. Okay, now what does Raptor stand for? Well, this stands for the regulatory associated protein of mTOR. Okay, so regulatory associated protein of mTOR. Okay, so the R is for regulatory, the A is for associated, the P is for protein, and then the TOR comes from of mTOR there. Okay, so we'll cover the regulatory associated protein of mTOR in blue here. Okay, and it's bound to the mammalian target of rapamycin in this mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1. Okay, right. So there are more proteins uh, in this uh, complex. So the next one we'll talk about is a protein that is known as MLST8. Okay, so MLST8. And this stands for the mammalian lethal with SEC13 protein 8. So where should I write this? I'll put it underneath here again. So this stands for the mammalian, that's the M. Then the L is for lethal, and then uh, with SEC13, so the S is for SEC13, 
and then I don't know where the tea comes from, but then it's protein. Maybe they took the tea from protein. And then um, it's the mammalian lethal with sec 13 protein 8. Okay, so we'll colour in MLST8 in pink here. Okay, so we've got these three proteins so far. The mammalian target of rapamycin, the regulatory associated protein of rapamycin, the mammalian leaf full with sec 13 protein 8, MLST8, and uh, now we're going to have two more on top of this. So another major one is Deptor, which is down here. Okay, so this is Deptor, okay, which has a similar name to Raptor. And uh, this stands for the domain containing mTOR interacting protein. So let me put this down here. So the domain, that's the D. Okay, and then uh, I don't quite know where they got the E and the P from, but well, the P is probably for protein, but it's domain containing mTOR interacting protein. Okay, so the domain containing mTOR interacting protein. So I think I'll colour the domain containing mTOR interacting protein, or DEPTOR, in turquoise. So, where is my turquoise pen? So the domain containing mTOR interacting protein will have in turquoise here. So this is another protein that is within the mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1. Okay, and then finally, attached to the RAPTOR protein up here, there is another protein known as PRAS40. Okay, so up here is PRAS40. Now PRAS40 is part of the inactive mTORC1, however it's going to be cleaved off when we actually activate uh, the mTORC1, although that isn't the main step in the activation of mTORC1. Um, it is a step, you know, you, in the active mTORC1 you do have PRAS40 removed, but there's more important uh, steps to activate mTORC1. Okay, right. So, what we want to now understand is how uh, AKT is going to lead to the activation of this mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1, because it is this mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1 that is then going to cause the differentiation of the cell into uh, its um, T helpers, naught cell in the case of CD4 positive naive T cells, and cytotoxic T cell in the case of CD8 positive naive T cells, and then is going to trigger the proliferation. Okay, so how does AKT activate the mTORC1? Well, we'll see that in the next video.